Hi, this is Gay Hendricks, and I want to invite you to this episode of our podcast, which is all about distraction. One of those what? Big things. <laughs> 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 and it's all about also how to recover quickly from distraction and the different ways people get distracted. And we also have some really valuable tips on how to make the business part of your life really flow smoothly. So if you're the kind of person who if you find your brain or someone else's brain is like a bag of gnats on amphetamine or a whole bunch of squirrels running around, this episode is for you. We'll see you in just a moment. Hey, Gay, look, a squirrel. Uh, All right. <laughs> yes, what that is what this today. episode's all about. <laughs> what, 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 what? Yeah, um, I actually, uh, we have a phrase around here we call uh, having a squirrel moment because what will be happening is uh, my two cats, uh, I'll be brushing one of them. And she'll be really enjoying being brushed. And then she'll see a squirrel outside. She'll run to the window to, you know, to give her the zoomies. Yeah. And uh, so um, <laughs> we say squirrel. But uh, I can't remember. What was that name of that movie that had that in it? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, God oh, dang it. It's that's right. Not, oh. Oh. Wasn't it? Oh, oh yeah. That's yeah. right. Oh. What a, oh, such a great movie. Great movie. But yeah. Mm. yeah so distractions. How to deal with distractions. Um, if I may boast a bit, I think I'm a master of dealing with distractions because I used to be highly distractible, and now I almost never get distracted under any circumstances. And so um, I think it's possible to uh, spend a lot of time, waste a lot of time being distracted if you could reel back in that amount of time and put it on something. You can really work miracles. Uh, what's been your experience of that, Mike? Um, I, I'll tell you what. I would say I was always super, super, super ADHD. And technically, I still am. But I've learned enough about my brain and how to prevent it from happening and, you know, I know some people, the comments that people say about me will be, I can't believe you get so much stuff done and you do a lot of things. So I know in my heart of hearts that if I would have focused on the one thing, um, you know, I'd be richer than I am and I'd be maybe a lot of things, but I'm not unhappy. It's just more of a matter of I've learned to accommodate my interest, which is I'm interested in a lot of stuff. I like doing a lot of stuff and I love lots of relationships. But when the rubber needs to meet the road, I'll get focused, get stuff done. And that's really what I'm prepared to do in this episode today is talk about five key systems that I've developed that not only I do work for me, but I use them and I teach them and I incorporate them in my advisory work when I'm working with clients to make sure they're focused, but they also get what they want. I um, also have several keys that I use that will be interesting to see what we, uh, how we overlap. Um, one of the most useful ones I use on a regular basis. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard this story, but there was a famous, um, uh, consultant about 100 years ago named Ivy Lee, and he uh, taught very big CEOs, um, you know, the head of the Ford Motor Company and places like that, how to organize their time. And uh, there was this one famous story where um, he went in with the CEO of US Steel at the time, which was one of the largest corporations in America. And he followed the CEO around for a couple of days, just watching what he did. And at the end of that time, he said, okay, I'm going to have you do one thing different a day. And when I come back in two weeks, you tell me how it's gone and you tell me what it's worth and write me a check for that. And here's what he had the guy do. Make a to-do list, one through 10, starting with the thing he least wanted to do first. You know, kind of the most 
thing I'm dreading. Um, and he had him put together this list of 10 every day, every night before he went to bed or every morning when he got up. And uh, Ivy Lee came back in a couple of weeks and said, okay, how did that work for you? And the guy wrote him a check for $25,000, which 100 years ago was big bucks. I mean, it, it's, it still will buy you a, a nice car today. But uh, in 100 years ago, that's more like a quarter of a million dollars he was writing a check for, because that was the time you know, when uh, gas cost a nickel a gallon. And so um, I've always used that myself because it helps me organize I'm not a big organizer. I, I have a person who comes in and organizes me, but I'm just not by nature an organizer. And so she comes in once a week and kind of gets everything back in order that I've blasted apart. And so I don't have to think about that very much. But one thing I like to do is have my mind organized. Uh, I don't necessarily have all my papers laid out the way a lot of people do and everything. But up here, I put a lot of attention into what will organize my mind. And I find if I Oftentimes nowadays, I don't even have 10 things that I am going to be doing in the uh, day with the pandemic and all that kind of stuff. So meetings are out and all that. So um, I might have three things, but I always put the thing at the top that I'm least looking forward to doing, but needs most to be done. And there aren't that many of those, but if you avoid those and you know you put it off till three o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> you've been carrying it all day, might as well just knock it out early. So uh, that's, uh, I get myself a, a little three by five index card and uh, that's all my, uh, that's all I do as far as goals. Uh, interestingly enough, I used to consult um, for uh, Michael Dell down at um, Dell Computer. And uh, the first time I met him and was in his office, he took a little three by five index card out and looked at it. And I find that he did the same thing that I did, which is a great bonding thing, you know, to find that this person thinks like you do. And to this day, his mind just blows me away. I haven't seen him in 20 years, but uh, he's one of the sharpest human beings I've ever met. Well, as you talk about that, look at this. So uh, here are my three by fives and I still carry them. I've got them in, in my bag everywhere I go. Although I have found a strategy that is is more effective. So this is my mobile strategy, but if I'm at home or at our um, beach condo, I've got these stands, and you've seen those giant uh, whiteboard. They're basically giant post-it notes mm -hmm. on a on a whiteboard. So they're like two feet by three feet or whatever it is. They peel I've off. I've got them right behind me here. Uh, you can't. Okay. See them, I, I've got a I whole can't. bunch of them. Yep. And so um, I've got one of those portable boards. And if I'm speaking somewhere, I always have it. And I, um, um, I have it in, in, our, in, our, in our major rooms of the house. And I've always got, you know, some big markers, big thick markers. And so here's what I do. Um, I will begin. And this is the way I open up my consulting and advisory sessions. It's an anchoring and a grounding exercise. And what I'll do is I'll <clears throat> open up and I do this in the morning as well, as long as I remember it. You know, sometimes when I'm tightly scheduled, I don't do it, but I also know that these are not my most productive days. So I'm most productive and most on purpose if I do this. So I'll take a big deep breath, get in totally in my body, relax through my fingers and my toes, toes all the way up to my top of my head. And then I'll imagine shooting roots out of my legs and into the center of the earth all the way down. To, and I imagine like these roots grabbing the earth's core, like bird feet surrounding them and then tightening up and holding me steady um, in such a way that you're more like a palm uh, trunk, you know, so you're super flexible, but you're grounded to the center of the earth take a big deep breath in and get super, super aware of my surroundings. Meaning, you know, if I'm down at the ocean, I'll smell the ocean. I'll hear the palm trees, listen to the seagulls or whatever is going on and then smell that air. So I'm experiencing as much as possible through my senses and my body. And then I ask myself at that moment, what emotion or feeling do I want to experience right now and all the time? What's the emotion or feeling? So that's the first thing. 
is, is like, if there's something going on, it's going to show up and I'll write it down. And for example, um, one that came up for me this past, these past few days, because Vivian and I are in Las Vegas right now. We drove here from San Diego. We just wanted to get out of town and be in a different environment and try to hike in different mountains, you know? So we drove here. We're staying at this incredible um, penthouse condo. It's a friend of mine. I mean, it's a $9 million place overlooking the, the strip. And the feeling and emotion I would make is free you know the freedom to be able to do this whenever we want and i also love this freedom of appreciating and enjoying this exquisite place i mean it's um i told you before we started rolling that um we've been here for new years and they're launching fireworks and the fireworks don't even reach this floor it's so high up right it's unbelievable and we can see literally for a hundred miles or longer in any direction. So <clears throat> having done that, you know, like it's, I found that if I can get in the space of manifesting and anchoring into the feeling emotion, it's easier to manifest just about anything. So if that's step one. Then what I'll do is I'll come up with and, and ask myself, what are three big things that can create the most impact that are congruent with those feelings or emotions? And uh, again, for whatever reason, just being in the mental space, the emotional space, and all these things simultaneously, I lock into that, I write them down, and I even brainstorm. There might be a whole bunch of things that I know I need to get done or do. Might end up being 12 of them. But I'll circle the top three and then I'll look at all the rest and ask which ones can I delegate or outsource right now. And then just to feel like I made some progress, I'll make an audio note from my executive assistant or anyone else on my team. And I'll just assign as many things and outsource them as I can with instructions. And then they're done and out of the way. And I know that something's getting done and I have leverage. And then the other three, three, I can focus on and accomplish and, um, and make some major progress. And then um, I'm going to let you just comment here because I know you probably have some big ideas. And then I'll give you two other big things that I found keep me focused and get a lot done. Yeah. Well, what, one of the things that you were talking about fits very much with something that I believe profoundly and that keeps me sane in a, in a life that has a lot of potential distraction to it. Um, and that is to ground yourself in your body, to learn to use your body as the broadcasting beacon uh, that it is. Uh, instead of trying to broadcast all your manifestation energy from that small part of your brain that pictures things and has words in it, um, you're not taking advantage of the whole system. And so the more you can open up and find ways of putting your whole body to work for you, uh, that's really important. Beyond that, I think it's so important also to home in on your genius and to be rigorous about protecting your genius zone. Uh, I mentioned um, on another podcast of ours that I have a new book out uh, in the summer uh, called The Genius Zone. And one of the things that uh, the one of the points the book makes is how essential it is to let yourself know what your genius is and let the world know what your genius is. In other words, to be transparent to what your true genius is. And there's an art and a science to that. And the new book is a lot about the kind of the specific technology about how to open up that area. But the main point is, the more you can focus in on your genius and be doing what you most love to do, the easier it is to protect that against distractions, because you've got more to protect. You're protecting your genius. And so, I'll tell you, on a given week, let's see, this happened twice last week, I believe. Um, someone comes to me and asks me to do something or wants me to participate in something, and I try it on, 
And it doesn't feel like it's in my genius zone, even though it might be worth some money. So at least once a week, I say to somebody, you know, that sounds like a really great idea for someone else, but it's not really in my sweet spot of what my genius zone is. And then sometimes I've even had people try to argue with me. No, no, this is, you know, (laughs) but you have to trust your body enough to tune in and say, okay, is that truly going to serve my genius? Because I'll tell you, especially the more mature I get, the more rigorous I get at being able to say no. Uh, I think uh, one of the big mistakes of life is to be sloppy about your no saying. Um, I always say that uh, the path to your genius is made equally of things you say yes to and things you say no to. Being able to say no to things that are not in your genius zone is one of the high achievements of life. And it takes a lot of practice um, because um, there's a tremendous amount of distractions in life that are trying to distract you from your genius. But I don't want you to be distracted. I want you to keep homing in on a daily basis with that so that you know that's where your true home is. Okay. I have an idea for you that um, I've known this, but I didn't think I, I don't think I've ever articulated it. Um, the secret to this is asking yourself with, with total clarity, what, how much does it cost for me to give up my freedom and ask what is the price of your freedom? Now I'll tell you something that completely changed by orders of magnitude, my income a few years ago. <clears throat> and it was about three years ago. And you know, part of the story, Gay, I told you it before, but the short summary is I had reached a point after, you know, building and selling a total of five companies. Actually, this was the fourth. And um, uh, the business had grown to the point where I had very complicated funnels. And this is you everywhere now business. So we had five core products. It was publish and profit, how to write a book and become a bestseller. 1800 people went through it, speak and profit, how to speak, speak and sell and do webinars and all that create and profit, how to create your own information products and turn your ideas, wisdom and knowledge into information and sell it. And then consult and profit, which is how coach, coach, consult, advise, make money with your, wisdom, knowledge, and expertise. And then the, the last one, we called it the Celebrity Boot Camp, where we did media training in my studio. All of which I enjoyed the performance, performance aspect, but the business got to the point where it no longer was fun. And specifically what had happened was um, I had f- complicated funnels and we sold a $2,000 information product. And then we did $5,000 live events, $25,000 mastermind, whatever in between. And my funnels broke and my ads started to break and they didn't work right. And there were team members that we had outgrown and, and it was like, just to replace them, it was complicated, not fun and operationally. It was just like, I just woke up one day, I was like, Ugh, I just don't want to do this anymore. And worse than that, I started feeling depressed. Like I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. And I, I, I like, I was just sad. My soul was sad. It was time to leave. And so, uh, make a long story short of that part, I managed to wind it down and shut it down. And, um, I had enough, money where we didn't have to work for a chunk of time because I sold the products and the business and and had some advisory deals in motion where it was like, I could have taken off a year and a half. No problem. It wouldn't have affected anything. But um, I decided to start doing some more advanced coaching and consulting. And the new deal was it caught, I decided to price my time. It was a minimum of $50,000 to engage me. So my price of freedom was $50,000 and it made really easy sense. If I had a conversation and someone would ask for my help, I'd be like, I'd love to help you. It's $50,000. And if they were like, great, no problem. It was an easy yes. And if it wasn't, it was an easy no. And I didn't need the money. And the funny thing is, is is when you actually take on that mindset, you'd have, you know, all it takes is one deal, depending on your, on your overhead, your spend. Um, Obviously you you have to be worth that, 
but it doesn't take a lot of deals every year to be more than have more than enough and have time to think. And the more freedom you have, the more time you have, the more valuable you become because you're thinking clearly and you're not moving out of desperation. And so um, hopefully that makes sense. But the, the price of freedom, just, it can be arbitrary, make something up and try it out. And I think your brain will solve problems and determine if your big thing is, well, I don't think I'm worth that much. It's like, well, your brain will find a way to provide that level of value, or you'll find the right fit person where you can provide that kind of value for them. Mm. So anyway, I don't That's know. Point, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, uh, one thing I think about is instead of going looking for clients to make the change in here, you know, the closer you can make the change inside yourself, the easier it is, just like steering a boat from the back of the boat is preferable to standing up on the front of the boat and trying to steer it from up there. Um, And so the shift I think you need to make inside yourself is what kind of client do I want to attract? And am I that kind of person myself? You know, to find connection points between yourself and the kind of person you want to attract to be really focused a lot on the inward part of that, because the outward part of it will often take care of itself. You'll, as you make the inner shift, you'll see ways to do the outer stuff, the right kind of ads to buy or the right kind of people to connect with. But unless you have that inner connection with yourself and what am I really useful for? What is my contribution? How can I make my biggest contribution? And who do I want to make my contribution with? What kind of person? I think that's really the kind of work you need to do inside. And that also helps you avoid distractions too, because the more you can be clear on kind of what you want to attract in the world, the the easier it is to kind of swat away and shoo away the things that come along that kind of test you with um, with kind of tests to uh, will you do this for the money or will you do this for the glory or will you do something you don't want to do because it'll be good for you later and uh, so I want you to avoid that kind of thinking if at all possible. Yeah, I love that. So I have another another little technique that I've been using. As long as I can remember, um, although now I do it very, very consciously, I think I kind of accidentally did it in the past. It was one of those things where it, it evolved, but it's, it's really using the super conscious subconscious mind. So when I've got something that I need to accomplish, and I'll give you a real life example. Um, so I've been lately doing monthly training webinars. And these monthly training webinars are such that um, I will uh, produce some sort of a, a live event and invite my audience to attend and teach something valuable. And I might spend weeks thinking about whatever it is I'm going to be teaching. And... Um, but it, what I've been doing is I'll wait literally till the last moment. So I'm procrastinating, legitimately procrastinating to prepare for this thing. But I'll create like an outline and it might take place over a couple of weeks. And then right before I go to bed, like either what, the night before this big presentation is due or the day before. So I'll give myself either 24 or 48 hours. I will meditate on that thing. And imagine myself performing it. So what I do is I do it as the super conscious performance. And I think great musicians do this as well. But I'll imagine myself performing whatever this is and imagine entertaining and educating the audience. And uh, now in this case, when I'm doing these, I'm usually selling some sort of a product or service as well. It might be $10,000, $30,000, $50,000, whatever. And... I will get up in the morning and I usually get up at like four thirty or five o'clock and maybe the presentation's at 10. So I'll have, I'll have four to five hours and I will literally just bang out the entire presentation 
in four or five hours that would have probably taken me two weeks to do if I wouldn't have done it this way. I know that's the case because that's what it's taken me in the past when I, you know, broke it down and I had my team help me and I did all this stuff. It's like sometimes you just need a hard deadline, the fear of screwing up and really, really specific intentions that are amplified and multiplied with a sense of performance. I think the brain has the ability to go into a deep mode of creation, explosive creation when it's given those ingredients. And so that's the other distraction thing is don't be afraid of uh, procrastination because it can be a, a very, very effective tool to force you to get something done when there is a real looming deadline instead of just an arbitrary one. I like that new uh, way to look at procrastination. Uh, that's what I always say to people about confusion, too. Confusion could be a really benevolent state um, because if you can't really think of the answer to something and you're confused about what to do, well, you're very close to having that shift into that big, open, spacious place that holds everything, you know, that big, vast ocean of pure consciousness that holds everything within it. And confusion is a place you can jump off into that from. But um, a lot of people go the other way with confusion by making themselves wrong for being confused instead of spreading out into it. So uh, not knowing can be a really good thing at times. But back to the subject of, of distraction, I think I want to say another word about saying no. Um, I think we need to learn what around here we call an enlightened no. It's, it's a no because you're aware of what you're saying no for. It's not a, a no that's designed to um, something that's inconvenient, but it's something that you've got a higher purpose you're serving. So the no becomes an enlightened no. You're not saying no out of fear, or you're not saying yes out of fear. You're saying, if you say no, you're saying no from a place that knows exactly what you're up to. And that takes a little bit of work on yourself to home in on what your true purpose is in any given situation. But that's what's going to get you out every time of, of wasting time or being distracted is to really home back in on what the, um, what the central mission is. But hey, also, I want to say, too, that um, not to make distraction a big, big bugaboo kind of thing, um, because uh, I almost would, would welcome it as a little test of yourself. You know, welcome some distraction in your life, because that'll let you know how good you are at getting back to it, because distractions are always going to happen. The metric that you should measure is how soon does it take you to get back to the subject at hand? Uh, because if it takes you 18 minutes to get back to a subject that you could have actually gotten to back to in two seconds, you know, that's a problem. Yeah, that uh, that makes sense. Um, I have another uh, tip, something that, God, I can't believe it took me this long to figure it out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually ashamed of it in a way and then, eh, I'm grateful too. but here's what it is. Um, first of all, um, Adderall is a remarkably powerful tool, and I know plenty of people who use it on a regular basis. Now, I also think that uh, you don't get anything for free from nature, but I have tried it before, and I found it remarkably powerful. But I'm going to tell you about a natural Adderall, and here's what it is. Um, well, something I've been doing now for about a year is uh, getting up when, I, when my body tells me to get up, so I don't wake up with an alarm. And uh, my ideal time is usually around 7.30 or 8. Although lately I've been sleeping later and longer, um, getting in like a full 8, 9, sometimes even 10 hours of sleep, um, which it wasn't always that way. You know, we all go through our cyclical hormonal changes as we age, which can be a son of a gun. But um, what has helped is I'll get up in the morning and I take some liquid liposomal vitamins. Um, in fact, I'm actually holding them right now. This is my favorite brand. 
It's from a company called, I don't know if you can see these right here, but the, the brand name is Quicksilver Labs. Okay. And uh, I took some, one of them is an ultra vitamin. There's another one called AMPK Charge. I take a vitamin C and the glutathione. And then lately, I've also been taking some peptides, which are um, uh, thymus and alpha one. They're just really good for your hormones and, and uh, uh, body in general. But here's the kicker that's made the biggest difference. I don't eat until about two in the afternoon. So I may have eaten the night before by seven o'clock or I'll be finished by then. And then I effectively am fasting for about 18 hours. Hmm. And I found that um, in my state of fasting, which I'll just drink water. Sometimes I might have a little bar if I'm feeling a hunger pain and I notice it's interfering. But I've noticed my brain works great until I eat. That's when I have the first dip. Hmm. And um, it did not take long for this to kick in. But now I've got my optimal performance. Focus gets stuff done is about nine until one or two in the afternoon. And then um, what I'll do is if I need something to eat, I'll eat something. And um, the rest of the day, I'll do more communicative stuff, stuff that is conversational in nature where I don't have to focus deliberately. But I think the point of it is, is um, experiment a little bit with your body. The only other enhancer it makes it even better is if I work out first thing in the morning and get on like a Peloton and do a significant um, movement exercise that uh, cause the sweat to occur and, you know, get to a uh, anaerobic state. Um, but uh, the, that has made a massive difference in my productivity. And for some reason, I, my body doesn't process caffeine well, but I feel great at least for a little while until I get have a cumulative toxic response to it. But if I um, have caffeine in the morning, I like drinking like a big bowl of chai or a big glass of chai. Um, my body hates coffee. It just I get really severe body aches from it. But um, if I do it like for a couple days in a row, uh, you know, sometimes I'll put up with the pain. Uh, but uh, the benefits in terms of productivity are extraordinary. I mean, I can just sit down and write chapters and chapters of a book or do something that requires performance mindset. So um, I think that's the key thing with distractions is uh, it really, again, again, it's mindset, it's planning, it's valuing, it's creating that emotional, physical connection. And then finally, um, any way to optimize your body performance where your physical state is uh, is great. But how about you? Have you found, what have you found for your physical state that's most effective? Um, I've never tried Adderall. Um, so uh, that's, that's a new one for me. Um, but um, my wife, Katie, is a master of all things supplement. And uh, she goes to great length to research all these things and I don't know. I probably take two handfuls of things a day and I frankly don't know what's in them, but she consults with doctors and things. And so um, I know some of them are um, uh, probiotic things and some of them vitamin C and liposomal things, uh, but I frankly don't know. Uh, it's just not my zone of genius. And so I kind of let her run that thing, but I feel great all the time. I uh, I used to feel that dip that you're talking about with food, but I can't remember feeling that in a long time now. Um, maybe if I'm out and I have some dessert with a bunch of sugar in it or something. Yeah, sugar, sugar or gluten are usually the 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 things that are going to get you. Yeah, sugar really knocks me on my fanny, um, and um, gluten doesn't seem to bother me, but I don't eat eat a lot of it anyway. But um, I, uh, I've really come to value, you know, like what we had today was a um, kind of a lamb stew with a little bit of protein in it and a bunch of other things like, you know, tomatoes and onions and vegetables. And uh, then yesterday I had a big salad. Um, our big thing is my wife makes lunch. She makes us a good lunch usually. She loves to cook, but she doesn't like to cook all the time. I make my own breakfast, and if I want a snack at night, 
but we have our big meal in the middle of the day. And I think that's, uh, I don't eat much at night. And that's been a key for me to wake up. Yeah, you know, um, I wake up very early. I don't ever use an alarm clock. I usually uh, wake up around 4, 4.15, 4.30 long in there. And then after I get up, I, I um, meditate and do some stretching and stuff before I get down to doing my writing or whatever it is I'm working on. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I, I, I don't know the technical names of all these things, but uh, I'm, um, I'm a big believer in tinkering until you find one that makes you feel zippy and relaxed. That's the way I like to feel, the zippy and relaxed, zestful, but eased inside. And uh, so that's the way I try to go through my day. I got it. Well, um, I will add this one thing. By the way, I was thinking when you said you get up at four or fifteen, I'm like, that's called hell o'clock in my brain. <laughs> um, but uh, I know I'd get used to it if I just practiced. It's just like, man, I just like that. Uh, um, I've just been finding I sleep, and the more I sleep, the better I feel. I mean, there's obviously a, a breaking point where it's it's not great. But what I was going to tell you about the Adderall thing. Um, I only tried it a couple times, but um, when you when you go back in time at how many uh, creative writers for years, decades, their most productive work, and for that matter, musicians and writers, um, the one thing that a lot of them have in common with one another is cocaine. Yeah, well, or something and, like and, that. The, uh, the yeah, great writer Balzac. He used to, or um, I'm sorry, Proust, he would go down to the, uh, uh, Balzac was a coffee freak, um, but um, Proust would go down to the pharmacy and get an ounce of bull adrenaline, <laughs> sip it. And he wrote those seven volumes of huge books, you know, the mem remembrance of things past. And uh, when I tried to read those in college, I thought he was on something to, <laughs> to write this. And same thing with Freud. You know, Freud, a lot of his work was done under injectable, very pure cocaine um, that they had back in his time. And it wasn't until a friend of his got super strung out and he had to stay up all night with him having a psychotic episode that he said, OK, let's ease off on the cocaine, because he actually wrote a little pamphlet touting it as the, mis uh, the great miracle drug of his time. And uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the closer you can get to natural substances, uh, the more I'm in favor of them. It's yeah, I'm not a proponent. I was because uh, what I found for me was, um, first of all, unpredictable. There'd be times and, and like I just couldn't sleep. I'd get like two hours of sleep and the sleep I got was very restless. And so um, the performance, the benefits, the focus was amazing um and obviously these uh pharma companies have figured out how to basically make legal cocaine and um time release it in such a way that but you know, ultimately you don't get anything for free from nature so uh, i think we both agree 100 percent on that it's find the natural means find a way to uh break through the mindset and the psychology of being distraction free but also the reasons why and the anchors and the meditative pools. So um, anything else you want to add to this chapter before we send people over and talk to them a little bit about the big leap year and sharing this with their friends? Yes. Uh, well, um, I see distraction as a very positive thing in a way because it uh, lets me know what tends to captivate me. And But as I say, don't worry too much about what distracts you measure the time it takes you to get back. The quicker you can get back to whatever you're focusing on, that's the key thing. Yeah. And I'm, for me, it's all about uh, what's going to provide the most impact and also the, the value and the cost of freedom. So I know the, one of my core things that motivates me more than anything is I want to have known that I bought my freedom and that work or anything is optional. Everything is a want to do, not a have to do. And we do need obstacles to keep us hungry and keep us active. But just knowing that if you needed to or wanted to, you could buy years of freedom to think and to, to just 
ponder and wonder and get back into a childlike state. And I would say that, um, you know, some of my focus as well as some of the distractions were very, very expensive. But at the end of the day, um, they've been worth the fact that I've been able to buy my freedom. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you're in the same spot. We don't have to work. We want, we do it because we want to, and it gives us an outlet for creativity and connection and, uh, impacting other people. I can't think of anything I'd rather do than the work I do. If I, if there was something I'd find, to, I'd go do it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, to, to me, the idea of, sharing things I know and doing that in a state that makes me feel good and helps other people. That's, that's living at its best to me. Agreed. So we'll let uh, you go, our listener read, but before we do that, Gay and I are going to tell you about one thing that if this is interesting to you and you want to live this and also learn ways to get past any kind of limiters or your upper limits challenges head over to bigleappodcast.com and there you can learn about the Big Leap Year. It's something that Gay and I have planned um, to help you get to your next level of creativity, um, being able to uh, have more impact. You'll learn some of Gay's greatest secrets for writing books and creating content as well as um, some of our strategies for earning more, living more, and being able to um, do more with your life. Gay, anything else you'd like to add about the Big Leap Year? I think it's a marvelous opportunity. Anytime you can commit yourself to something big, transformative and you can't possibly know where it's going that's to me one of the best things you can do is to open yourself to learning and say okay i'm going to commit myself to it and go all the way yep and be accountable at the same time so all that is available just head on over to bigleapyear.com there's a button to apply uh we're just reaching out to people right now to get the uh, big leap year going this is a once in a lifetime experience gays agreed to do it once so um it's an opportunity to get uh coached by the two of us in a small group of really really cool people and uh, the last thing that I'll add is um, if you've enjoyed this episode, we know you have, uh, make sure you uh, share it, you comment. Also, uh, leave a, a comment and a rating on the iTunes store. That will make a big difference. If you can think of someone who can benefit from these messages or you want someone who's distracted to be a little more focused either for themselves or for you, share this episode with them. Okay, I'll let you close this one out. Well, we started off with a squirrel moment, and um, but uh, life is about one distraction after another and how you do Aikido with those to return to the focus is uh, one of the great arts of life. So we hope we've uh, helped you with that a little bit today. All right. Thanks as usual. It's awesome to create with you, Gay. You too, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.